Located in central eastern Utah, Arches National Park is famous for the natural arches from which it draws its name, as the area is home to the highest density of arches in the world. In addition to natural arches, the park is home to countless unique and vibrant geological features found almost nowhere else on Earth. The various habitats in the park attract many species of animals, from insects to large mammals, as well as a medley of plants, from grasses to trees. The geological features of the park, although seemingly resilient, are particularly vulnerable to erosion, in part due to weathering and in part due to the large number of visitors to the park every year. Arches National Park is situated in the Colorado Plateau, an area in the Four Corners region almost completely surrounded by sub-ranges of the Rocky Mountains. The plateau has undergone a variety of geological changes, many of which were brought about by the action of water. Around 310 million years ago, tectonic activity resulted in the uplift of a small mountain range in eastern Utah and western Colorado. Around the same time, an area directly to the west of this range descended due to northwest-southeast running fault lines, creating what is today known as Paradox Basin. At that time, the region was close to a large inland sea, and the basin trapped much of that water. The water brought in sediment, which settled at the bottom of the basin, as well as layers of salt that remained after the water evaporated. Over time, influxes of water from the nearby sea brought in more salt, which precipitated to the bottom of the basin. At least 29 separate influxes of salt water into the basin collected thousands of feet of salt in the basin. Erosion brought in sediment from the nearby mountains, gradually building up a few thousand feet of iron-rich, red, orange, and tan sediment atop the salt layer. Over hundreds of millions of years, sediment continued to accumulate in the Paradox Basin, becoming more and more compacted. As the sediment became more dense than the salt beneath it, the salt began to flow to areas of lower pressure, forming domes and ridges, as well as anticlines, layers of sedimentary rock folded over like arches. During this movement of salt and sediment, the entire area was also in the process of being uplifted alongside the rest of the Rocky Mountains. While the activity of salt eroded the sedimentary rock from below, cracking and forming new fault lines in the sandstone, the activity of ice, water, and wind eroded the sediment from above, removing younger and weaker layers of rock from the surface. The sediment was washed away, leaving behind a landscape sculpted from vibrant colorful sandstone. This sandstone would provide the ideal mold for the formation of the geological features seen in the park today. With the pressure of more than 1,000 feet of sediment gone, the deeper layers of sandstone rebounded, moving upwards and creating large faults, many of which are responsible for the fins seen in the park. As water permeated through the sandstone and turned to ice during winters, it dissolved the salt and formed crevices in the rock, which eventually grew and broke large sections of rock into smaller, freestanding features. For the most part, water sculpted the sandstone along pre-existing fault lines, resulting in more sharply defined fins. However, water permeating through pores in the rock also created a feature known as Swiss cheese rock. Freestanding fins were carved by the forces of wind and water. While some collapsed completely, others remained standing, with windows carved through them. As these windows grew, they became the arches for which the area is known. The majority of the exposed geological features in the park today are formed from Entrada and Navajo sandstone, giving them their distinct pink, red, and orange appearance. The landscape of arches, fins, windows, towers, and multitude of other geological features of Arches National Park are constantly changing, prompted by many of the same forces that carved the terrain. Water continues to erode the sedimentary rock of the region, and ice slowly chips away at the unique structures. 
Sediment from erosion is washed away by numerous streams throughout the park, all of which feed into the Colorado River at the southeast of the park boundary. At least 2,000 arches stand within park boundaries today, many of which were not there one million years ago and will not remain in another million years. Countless arches have collapsed in the time humans have known about them, and more have taken their place. In addition to the weakness of sandstone, erosion is accelerated by visitors, who damage the bacterial base of the dirt found in much of the park and loosen the already fragile soil. The semi-arid continental climate of the region leads to high temperature fluctuations and low precipitation in the park. During the summer, the area experiences average daytime temperatures of almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit, although temperatures over 110 degrees Fahrenheit are common. Little precipitation falls in the summer, often only a few inches. Most precipitation falls in autumn and winter, when the weather cools down significantly. During the winter months, the temperature often falls below freezing, and snow can cover the park, but the snow typically does not remain on the ground for long, as winter days can be warm and sunny. By April, the cool weather begins to heat up, and plants and animals emerge from dormancy to gather food and hunt for prey. The low precipitation and high temperature swings make the park a harsh environment for most plants and animals. Bacteria and lichens play a large role in making the land more hospitable for larger living organisms, helping to break down dead plant matter, retain water, and make nutrients more available. Bacteria can be found throughout the park, typically in sandy areas where they are often accompanied by lichens. These organisms can turn sand into a living soil, which helps plants, such as grasses and cacti, take hold. Grasses, flowers, and cacti dominate the landscape, creating bright displays of color that complement the landscape in spring and summer after rainfall. The wide grasslands are interspersed with shrubs and small trees, such as Utah juniper, purple sage, and Mormon tea. Closer to geological outcroppings such as fins, large plants, mostly pinyon pine and Utah juniper, are more abundant. These trees do not require much soil to grow, and can colonize very rocky areas. Small pockets of flowing water, found in crevices between rocks shaded from sunlight, are home to plants such as columbines or moss. The few rivers in the park, which only flow for part of the year, support the occasional deciduous trees, such as cottonwoods, which have roots that can reach water deep beneath the ground. Closer to the Colorado River, large trees and more varied plant and animal life are common due to the availability of water. These shady environments throughout the park area attract many herbivores seeking shelter and food. The herbivores in turn attract carnivorous animals such as snakes and birds of prey. These animals are adapted to the extreme heat of the desert and most hunt during dawn or dusk to avoid the daytime heat. Humans have inhabited the area of southeastern Utah for more than 10,000 years, living close to the Colorado River, which provided food and water. Many petroglyphs depicting animals and hunting scenes have been found throughout the plateau region, including in the park boundaries. Artifacts such as spearheads and water vessels some thousands of years old, have been found in the surrounding regions and the nearby canyonlands. Early native inhabitants likely lived in caves in areas sheltered from severe heat, but little is known about the earlier humans who lived and hunted in the locale, as they left few traces of their activity. It is likely that the plateau was only temporarily inhabited, as climate patterns may have forced humans to leave for areas with more easily available food and water. Later tribes, specifically the Fremont, Pueblo, and Anasazi people, are known to have inhabited the area sporadically starting around 1,000 years ago, and were mostly gone by the late 12th century. By the 15th and 16th centuries, 
The area of modern-day Arches National Park was mostly uninhabited, with occasional tribes of Ute peoples traveling through the park. It was these tribes that Spanish explorers and fur trappers first encountered when they reached the Arches in the mid-1700s. Although trappers and explorers traveled through southeast Utah, they rarely stayed for long, instead using the well-traveled trail along the Colorado River as a path to more western states such as California. It was only in the late 1800s that American pioneers began to permanently settle in the region, after more than one failed attempt. Civil War veteran John Wesley Wolfe was the first to establish his house and ranch near what is today known as Delicate Arch. The house was built near a creek, which allowed Wolfe to grow vegetables in addition to ranching cattle. The ranch and cabin still stand in their original spot to this day. Throughout the early 20th century, southeast Utah and its unique geological features attracted many visitors, some of whom were interested in mapping and preserving these features, and some of whom were interested in the resources the area had to offer. While cattle ranching and agricultural activity in the area would not have been viable on a grand scale due to the dry climate, southeastern Utah was rich in precious resources such as oil, potash, uranium, and vanadium. Many mines sprang up north and south of the modern-day area of Arches National Park, and natural resources were extracted in huge quantities. Many people proposed mining within the modern park boundaries, as the millions of cubic feet of potash and gypsum found underneath the sandstone would be a great way to make money and boost industrial and agricultural production. Several lines of transportation for both people and resources also traveled near the arches, making mining in the area potentially more lucrative. Residents of the nearby town of Moab were alarmed at the potential destruction of the natural beauty of the arches, and were therefore heavily against the development of the area into a mining sector, arguing instead that tourism was the better option. While some people proposed that nearby railroads could help develop the region into a tourist attraction, others lobbied the government to protect the land. Thus, Arches National Monument was created on April 12, 1929 by President Hoover and placed under authority of the newly created National Park Service. The monument initially covered only 4.5 thousand acres, which was expanded to 34,000 by President Roosevelt in 1938, expanding the protected area to encompass more of the geological features for which the park is known today. By the 1960s, the monument was one of the premier attractions of eastern Utah. The monument was redesignated a national park on November 12, 1971, by President Lyndon B. Johnson, who also expanded the park area to over 70,000 acres. Because of the park's protection from mining and resource extraction for most of its history, the geology and ecology of the park has been mostly well preserved. However, more than one million yearly visitors endanger the fragile landscape of the park. While the National Park Service preserves the park to the best of their ability, Arches National Park is an ever-changing environment, and one that may not be around for much longer. Thank you for watching, and as always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like or subscribe for more educational documentaries. Check out more videos on the channel, or check out my friends' channels for more content.